That's not a comic book. Now that's a comic book. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Comic Reviews. Everything should be working well. I certainly hope so, at the very least. Hope everyone's having a good time. If you're watching this after the fact, doesn't look like I got anyone here live quite yet. That's okay, I'm hearing something buzzing in the other room. Oh well. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't look like I got anyone live here quite yet, but that's okay. We'll just give people a minute or two. Hope everything's going well. Uh, I don't have a ton of books this week, but I'm a, off to a bit of a late start because uh, <laughs> my wife's car just randomly wouldn't start, which kind of sucked. Um, so I had to try to go jump it, and that didn't work out. Uh I have no idea where the uh, the negative jumper port is on my car. And and before you go, oh, stupid comic book fan doesn't know anything about cars. No, I, I've, I've jumped cars before. I, it's been a while. I've been back to high school. But, like, I open up the hood, and, and right there is the positive, And there's just, like, it's just no negative. It's I'm used to being right next to each other. None. I had, like, a little box with computer chips in it. Didn't know what the fuck to do, so it's fucking around on my phone for like 15 minutes trying to figure it out. That was, that was a fun experience. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the lesson of the day. Figure out where the negative jumper port is on your car. Don't take it for granted that you'll just know because that's not necessarily the case. Anyway, hope everyone's doing well. i got a couple people here live now, so I think that should do. Uh, let's go ahead and show off what we'll be talking about this week. Uh, for new books this week, I've got The Flash, number 47, Batman Beyond, number 20, Black Hammer, uh, Age of Doom, number 2, Super Sons, number 16, and Wonder Woman, number 47. Uh, and then for Trade Talk this week, we'll be talking about Justice League of America, Tower of Babel. Uh, and this will be the last Justice League book I talk about for the foreseeable future uh, on Trade Talk. So hope you stick around and stay tuned for that. It's actually really funny about the the way things kind of lined up this week. So I'll, I'll make sure to talk about that. Uh, you know, stay tuned for the Super Sun discussion. It's kind of funny. Anyway, um... Now, if someone's watching this after the fact, and you've sat through all this, and you're like, God, just get to the comic reviews already, I'm going to remind you, timestamps in the description. I want to say hi to my live viewers. Hey, Zoro Fan Productions, thanks for showing up as always, and we also have the real Manos here. Hi, Manos! So you're trying to, to hop back on the horse of the weekly comic r uh, reviews. Um, good luck, my friend. You, you get your pull list up enough, uh, Vac and I would love to have you on for the monthly com comic roundup, so let me know. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started and talk about The Flash, number 47. Uh, so this is it. This is the first official issue of Flash War, which is the big event that that's going on in the Flash books and is going to affect the entire DC Universe and and make it all a brand new thing uh like every other week um so i'm picking up this book because jake carlson he and i've been doing reviews of jeff john's flash run um and he's like oh pick this up i want to hear you talk about it i'm like okay i'll give it a shot because i like flash well enough you know and I don't hate this or anything, but there is a lot of forced drama that, at least to me, feels very forced. Um, and just really, like, like I can tell they're trying to to drive a wedge between um, between Wally and Barry uh, that just doesn't necessarily feel natural. I don't know. I don't know, like the the lead up. I mean, to be fair, it's forty seven issues into Williamson's run. I don't know the lead up he's done. I don't know how organic it feels for his run, given the special circumstances that Wally's going through. So, 
I could be really off base, and it could be reasonable to have Wally kind of in this very confrontational place with Barry where they keep butting heads. But at the same time, I now feel I have a pretty good sense of who Wally West is from reading Morrison Millar and Jeff Johns' run, which this is intentionally capitalizing on in a big way, especially reusing artists from that era, Howard Porter and... Um, I can't remember his name. Ah, shit. Jake's gonna kill me. Scott Collins! Boom! <laughs> um, especially bringing back Porter and Scott Collins, it just, it feels like it's really trying to be, in a lot of ways, a return to that era. But you're kind of making Wally a bit irrational, and you're doing this in such a way where it feels like Barry's the one who's kind of in the right. And I don't know. So I don't, I don't love that. Um, we get like this big moment and, and Barry's the one being rational and Wally's the one who's like, I want to time travel and fix the universe. And so, I don't know, basically any time a character in DC wants to fix everything, they're automatically on the wrong side. You ever notice that, like, like Parallax and Hal Jordan, or like, like Injustice Superman wants to fix everything? You know, that's just what it usually is. It's like the the person who wants to fix it all is is usually the bad guy. Um, so it feels like Wally is very much meant to be in the wrong in this story. Uh, but hey, you get what you get. Uh, and then we get a flash back to what started this whole affair. They're button heads arguing, but they're still working together. Wally doesn't want to go get tested on himself about these these memories he keeps having. Um, but then, before they can really even have this discussion, the renegades show up. Not the rogues, the renegades, which is the future law enforcement officers that deal with the reverse flash. Uh, time travel galore, folks. Um, so yeah, I get the, the renegade show up, and they want to arrest Iris for murdering Thawne. Uh, I didn't know that even was a thing that happened, but okay. Uh, they try to talk it out. Of course, superheroes are incapable of talking anything out. Um, and they start running off, and it's a fight, and then, uh, they, they pull in, and I, as a Green Lantern fan, I quite like this. They have Golden Guardian as a member of the Renegades, which, you know, seems like a, a reference to, um, uh, what's her name? Golden, not Golden Gale, that's Black Hammer. Shit, names tonight, guys. Uh, the gold shooting flash rogue. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, so Golden Guardian, however... has a Sinestro core ring. Un momento, por favor. Put it on so you guys can actually see it, right? There we go, focus. Yay. Uh, this is actually, oh, come on, focus. It's actually metal ring, it's uh, 3D printed. Um, like 3D carved is the proper term, I guess you'd say. Anyway, uh, so yeah, Golden Guardian shows up. She has a Sinestro Core ring, and she create. <laughs> Man, how's she killing me, bro? <laughs> Golden Shower. <laughs> anyway, uh, she she pops up and creates a bunch of constructs of the different evil speedsters to distract the flashes and and take them out so the the renegades can arrest um iris and it, it's kind of interesting the the intention there and barry goes ahead and explains it which i felt was kind of pointless but little hand holding's never awful and this isn't intrusive um kid flash hasn't experienced them their constructs created from our fears to throw us off our game kid flash don't let them okay um, you know, that's that's reasonably clever. I quite like that. I do have a nitpick, though. Um, so, Golden Guardian says, 
Beware your fears made into light. Let those who try to stop what's right burn like my power, Sinestro's might. It's not the oath. Uh, it's not Sinestro's oath. Uh, did, did she even say the beginning of it? Oh, in Blackest Day and Brightest Night. Yeah, she got the beginning of it. Um, when a core member says the oath, they say burn like his power, Sinestro's might. Um, at least, to be fair, I haven't been reading mainline continuity D, uh, Green Lantern stories for a long time, so maybe they've changed it, but that feels like that was that was a slip up there. Um, so anyway, they fight, and I kind of like the fight. It's pretty cool. Uh, just got tons of, of the evil Flashes attacking the, the Flash family there. That's pretty neat. Um, anyway, uh, then it all kind of settles down because Iris is willing to hand herself over for judgment. Um, if they will help Wally with his, what the uh, leader commander cold uh calls what is it time headaches uh time travel changes uh wally is having what we in the 25th century call temporal seizures uh which means he's getting you know flashes of alternate timelines and universes and yada 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 so i don't know that's I like parts of that, and other parts just feel like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, so anyway, they all agree to go with him and to the Flash and to the 25th century, but once they get there, Wally hasn't transported with them, and he's instead been transported to the ruins of the Flash Museum, where Hunter Zolomon reveals himself and says that he's that Barry's been ignoring your pleas to help your friends and everyone that's been lost, and I'm here to help. Uh, I'm here because I'm willing to do that. We're going to go back and we're going to save everybody, including your children. Um, so, yeah, ultimately it comes down to Wally is put in a place here where he is very much susceptible to, I don't know, Fault, judgment, uh, but what would you call that, I guess? He's susceptible to manipulation, um, because he's both mentally taxed with all this, he's emotionally weighed on it because no one knows who he is, and he also can't, um, can't fully remember his own past, so, I don't know, there's a... There's enough going on where I'm like, okay, fine, but still, it just feels like Wally's really out of character here, just for the excuse to have the Flash's fight. Um, it's a life and death race when two Flashes collide in Flash War. I don't know. I'm liking the variant covers that DC's putting out, though, with these, these almost pure art covers. Um... And what's nice is a lot of comic shops, or at least mine, are selling them without any additional cost. They're the exact same price as the normal issue right now on the stands. Um, so this is a beautiful way to get it. Just pure art. I love the detail here. Hi-Fi did the cover. Um, right? Where's the damn credits at? Credits take too long to get into an issue. This has got to be at the end then. Um, we need to get more consistent about that. Yeah, wait, no. What, Howard Porter... Oh, Howard Porter and Hi-Fi did the cover. Okay. Uh, you know, I've been reading Howard Porter... I've been reading Grant Morrison's Justice League run, and Howard Porter did the art for most of that. And... Man. What more experience and a colorist can do... God, this looks so much better. Uh, I mean, like, obviously you got benefits for newer techniques since, you know, computer coloring has, has become more of a thing, but damn, that looks so much better than than a lot of Howard Porter's uh, work on Justice League did. 
uh, and just the the coloring really really brings it out. Also, like you can see the the uh, construct flashes, the construct anti flashes, whatever you want to call them in the background. Gorgeous cover work though. Ah, oh, the electricity looks great. Hmm, love it. Absolutely love it. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and move on. Been talking about this too much. Uh, what's going on in the comments? They didn't allude to pre-New 52 Wally telling about how Flashpoint wasn't responsible for changing the timeline. I could see the wedge being about Barry's selfishness erased Wally's family. That's a good point. Uh, Zorro Fan Production says, Zorro Comics coming up? Not that I've heard of. Uh, you know, we need to write letters to Dynamite or something. They've got the license right now. Uh, yeah, Flash. Barry kind of ignorance Wally was over what he lost after Flashpoint. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ian, are you going to pick up Super Sons Meet Dino Mutt during the Hanna-Barbera month? Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay, let's go ahead and move along to Batman Beyond, number 20. Okay, folks, here it is, and live... Uh, live watchers, please get on your keyboards. I, I want to hear your thoughts. Robin Beyond, what do we think, folks? What do we think? Robin Beyond's costume. And, and keep in mind, people listening to this after the fact, or watching this after the fact, there's a delay between me asking a question and, and them even hearing it, much less the time it takes to type an answer. But, uh, yeah, I'm really curious what the live audience thinks of the Robin Beyond outfit. Um, the the context of the story and all that we'll get into. They say this is a prototype, but obviously this is along the lines of what they're thinking. And I'm curious what my live audience has to say. So if you're watching this after the fact and you're annoyed by the, the time gap and how long it takes me to be able to read comments, um, yeah, start, start coming live. Uh, Rio Mano says, is this Terry's brother? Yes, this is Matt. Matt is now going to be the the Robin, supposedly, of the Batman Beyond timeline. Matt um, McGinnis. Uh, so, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the context. Um, in the last arc, we had this whole thing setting up of this impossible situation where Terry's life was threatened and Matt had been watching all these videos of Damien training so he knew how to be Robin and yada 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 and put himself in danger and rift and and fighting and now he's, he's Robin. It was entirely too dragged out but we I, I liked where they were going with it so I kind of gave it a pass. Um, so now Matt is going to be Robin and Terry's not entirely happy about it but mainly I just want to talk about the look. I'm curious what people think about the look. Uh, so, any, any, um, anyone got some, some thoughts on the Robin Beyond costume here? I'm really curious, y'all, uh, cause when we, at the early days of this new series, it was really on the fence about, um, about Robin, or about Terry's, you know, new costume, which was like a... A prototype of the the main you know Batman Beyond costume um, and this so like that uh, that was a design a lot of people didn't like I did and I'm just curious what other people think on this because I I have my own opinions uh, Carl Maxey says I'm meh on, I'm meh on the Robin costume Robert Adamant says, I think finally and I may get back on the book I like the mask having a jawline and it looks like how I'd expect a future Robin suit looking. Need a bit of green in the color in the color scheme, though. Um, yeah, I could see that. The mask is green. Keep in mind, my lighting and setup and everything isn't a hundred percent. The mask does have a lot of green to it. Um, personally, for me, I'd like more yellow. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's to do with the. Um, the new, f or not the new 52, the, the red in the Batman Beyond suit that maybe I want the red played down in the Robin suit so the yellow contrasts more with the black. Um, to be fair though, there's not a ton of red in it in this beauty shot. You see more of it 
you know, in the next panel and, and stuff like that. Um, but in the beauty shot, it's got a lot of shadow on it. Uh, and yeah, there's more red as, as it goes in. Um, I do really like the yellow wings. I will give it that. I think the yellow wings are great. Uh, I, it's just me. This, the, everyone has things that they just like that just work for them. And this is, it's, it's one of them. I like glowy things. I like it when a thing is glowy. Uh, and so the frickin' Tron lines around the R and stuff really works for me. Um, I don't know. It just does, you know? <sighs> oh, man. Robert Emmett says, do away with the lines coming from the R. I like the glowy lines. That's my favorite part is the glowy lines. Maybe it should, you know, serve a purpose and... and Maybe that formation of the glowy lines isn't the best idea. I would like maybe to get rid of the R patch and just do, like, across the chest with the glowy lines forming an R would be kind of cool. I don't know. Just thoughts I have. The context of the story says this is a prototype design, and so it may change in the very near future. But this is, this is our first look at the thought process behind the Robin Beyond costume. And I really do like the yellow wings. I'd like to play up the yellow more than the red. I think you can straight drop a lot of the red, which admittedly doesn't make any sense for a Robin, but still, though. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyway, context of the story, a um, little raw, a little bit raw. Uh, one of the Jokers is hold up in police headquarters and is just massacring shooting people um, because he's he has seen the monster bat everywhere um, so comics are written you know weeks to months in advance of before they hit the shelves and obviously they have no way of knowing when a tragedy is about to occur like what happened in Santa Fe um, and even if this is inspired by those tragedies there's nothing wrong with using those kinds of situations as drama um, that's kind of the one of the points of, of superhero comics you know People had had to deal with being, you know, shaken down by the mob and to see Superman take out the bad guys and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's a way to channel that and and have some kind of um, release from it. It doesn't change the fact that when I see it in a book so recently after an event, I'm like, ah, oh, that hurts. Uh, it just, it's a little much, you know? <laughs> anyway. Uh, so yeah, he's like hallucinating Batman, and then Terry and Bruce have a whole conversation about Matt joining the team as a Robin. Uh, Melanie shows up and kisses Terry, and Dana sees it, so drama, drama, drama. Um, Matt and Terry go out to defeat the Joker, uh, but Matt doesn't do a good enough job to Terry's standards and so he says, you're never going to be Robin again. There will be no Robin. Um, so that's the lead off. I, you know, I just, I like Dan Jurgen's ideas. I really do. Because it's still him, right? Yeah, it's still Dan Jurgen's. I really do like his ideas. He milks shit way too much. He just does. It just goes on for too long anyway. Uh, so yeah, they take out the bad guy, though, and then we get a tease of Lady going home and, um, like, getting coffee from her Alexa, her future Alexa, which is called Melissa. Uh, Bruce also has one called Alfred. Nice, Bruce. Nice. Uh, she gets coffee from her Alexa and drinks it and then starts to hallucinate very venom looking batman like like if the venom symbiote got on batman 
that's what he would look like, right? Can we all agree on this? Maybe the symbol would be white. I feel like if I bust this up in Photoshop and just change the color of the bat symbol to white, this is just symbiote Batman. Um... <clears throat> anyway... Uh, so yeah, that's that's the the draw is someone, and I'm gonna you know bold prediction, someone's hacking, future hacking, the Alexas to to put hallucinogens in the um, in the products that people are drinking in their everyday lives, and and it's all a conspiracy to make people hate Batman, and commit acts of violence in his name. Uh. Okay, whatever. Um, let's see, Robert Emmett says, Now Matt leaves and becomes Nightwing Beyond. That actually happened. Uh, we had Nightwing Beyond for the briefest of minutes um, back in the, the New 52 Batman Beyond book before the New 52 Batman Beyond book with Tim Drake in it. There were, there were two Batman Beyond books during the New 52 one of them was great and had Terry as Batman. The other one sucked and had Tim Drake as Batman. Um, but yeah, it had uh, it had um, the like Terry met Dick Grayson as like like old man Dick, uh, and he was still kind of doing his Nightwing thing a little bit. Um, let's see here, future Scarecrow possibly. I, I could see that being the, the villain. Jurgens has has really been doing that. Um, li love it or hate it, that's kind of been his wheelhouse so far, is to just bring the previous villains back uh, in some way, shape, or form, or, or play with those gimmicks. Um, which I'm not against, but like the, the series Bible for Batman Beyond was... We're not just going to give Terry old versions or, or new versions of Batman's rogues. We're going to do different things with it. Um, so, who knows? <sighs> All right. Let's go ahead and move on to Black Hammer, Age of Doom, number two. Um... You know, the thing I love about this book was all the heart. And there's still some of that here, and that's definitely the best part. It's, it's getting a little bit where it's like, okay, epic, cool stuff. I'm like, alright, like, I can, I can, I guess we can do some epic, cool stuff. Like, Black Hammer goes to hell and fights demons. But I'm just like, can we get back to just the, the conversations on the farm? Please? Uh. Anyway. So yeah, Black Hammer, uh, who's now Lucy, she picked she picked up her father's hammer, very Thor situation here. Um or Arthur, I guess you could say. Uh she picked up her father's hammer, became Black Hammer, but now is in this purgatory kind of situation and gets tricked into going to hell. Um Meanwhile, Golden Gale and Barbie are trying to figure out what's going on with the history of the town and not really getting anywhere with it. Um, Lucy talks to Satan and and beats the shit out of demons with the black hammer, which is I guess it's epic and cool and whatever. Um, and that gets her out of hell because she's not worth the effort anymore. Then here's the little bit of heart we get. Which is Gail and uh, Barbie sitting here talking about their love lives. And Golden Gale talking about, you know, oh, I fell in love with a villain. And are you still trying to date that priest here? And he's like, oh, nah, he's got his own things to work through. Uh, and I can't believe you fell in love with a zombie. He's not a zombie. He's totally a zombie. Well, fine, don't knock it till you try it. Um, so that was kind of cool. That, that was the best part to me. Uh, then we go back to uh, Black Hammer trying to get s literally anywhere, I guess. Uh, and she's in the land of Nod, 
uh, which, based on this design, is this universe's version of the Dreaming a la Sandman. That's all cool, that's fine. I don't know, just... After such a long gap between proper Black Hammer, like, we had the whole Sherlock Frankenstein thing, and that was interesting in its own right. But it was supplemental at best. Um, like, it, it, I don't want to, like, call it bad or, or not worth it. Um, but yeah, we're, Akuma Ranger gets it. We're still on the farm. And this is issue essentially 14. 14 issues on the farm. Not even counting the Sherlock Frankenstein miniseries. So that's like, what was that, like six, seven issues? Um, it's just a lot where I'm like, okay, this book had a lot of heart and a lot of interesting character development. And now I feel like I'm just getting sucked into this this whole world trying to explain the mystery and I don't really care so much about the reason why they're on the farm so much as I just care about them as people uh it's a very lost situation um kind of feeling that I'm getting and that's that's slightly disappointing uh what can you do Philip Kelton says, is this one of those stories that reads better all at once? Um, probably, but like, there's that driving mystery thing and I don't really be able to tell you uh, how well it reads all together or how well I think it'll read all together until it's done, you know? I don't know, you, you get just tired of getting strung along. It's like what Spawn did, where it like 50 issues before anything happened. Um, Carl Maxey says, Ian, after Infinity War, did you check on your family to see if they were still in the universe? You know, no, I didn't. And I haven't talked to my mom recently. Kidding. Nah, I <laughs> actually just talked to her tonight. She got mad at me for arguing with her about Haley's car. <sighs> anyway, let's go ahead and move on. Talk about Super Sons, number 16, the conclusion of the Super Sons series. It was so good. It was so good for so long. Mm. It's okay. We're getting the the Super Sons meet Dino Mutt uh, issue next month, I believe it is. And then there has been announced a 12-issue series of Super Sons, like a self-contained book. Um... Okay, that's fine. That's cool. Um, still, there's there's something about the ongoing versus the limited series, you know? Because um, the limited series usually has a definitive story that it wants to tell in the, in the 12 or whatever issues it gets. Uh, and even if that series is set in continuity you lose the sense that the events surrounding things are going to affect the book, which usually is a problem, but sometimes can be fun. Um, like, events are, are... Everyone hates events, but everyone buys events, so secretly we all like events, right? Uh, but... How do, how do you phrase this? But there's something fun when, like, Blackest Night was happening, right? And suddenly, just in the Batman book, they had to deal with Black Lanterns. There's something fun and cool about that. Um, there's, there's something interesting and cool about, like, events going on in other characters' books affecting the Super Sons. And, and, and I want to see Damien and John 
deal with the bullshit. I want to see Damien and John arguing about, like, what the hell's going on in Flash War. And Damien being a jerk, and John being sensitive, and then neither of them knowing what to do about it. Uh, I don't know. Just stuff like that. Stuff like that in my head. Uh, everyone's sitting here talking about the grandfather in the comics uh, comments. So, the story is bookended uh, by a grandfather reading a story to his grandkids. Um, telling about the Super Sons fighting Amazo uh, to save the Justice League. And then it ends with a wink because he's going to tell them another story before he puts them to bed. Um, and, like, the, the big moment is the grandkids he's talking to, one of them is flying, so it's like, what's going on with this? And, and he doesn't say who the parents of these kids are, and yada yada, so, like, who's the grandfather here? Um... I don't know. Robert Emmett thinks it's John, since one of the grandkids is flying. I don't feel like John would be reading a story about himself in that regard. Part of me is tempted to think it's either Bruce or Clark. But I just don't know, because... Usually we don't let Superman age, so maybe it's Bruce, but... Usually Bruce is dead? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, that's just kind of where I'm at. Uh, I don't, I don't have any reasonable guesses, but yeah, I'm kind of floating in between Bruce or Clark. That's that's my uh, my fan theory. My my true answer though is we'll see. <laughs> um, so yeah, anyway, that's. That's the, the bookend. Let's talk about the story itself. Uh, when last we left the boys, that's just what I like to call them now, the boys. Uh, Kid Amazo had captured the Justice League and was slowly gaining all of their powers. Um, and John's on his own to fight him because Amazo wants to use John as a... Um, a suit basically he wants to funnel all his powers through John's body. Um, but Robin and Cyborg are right on their heels and and they're ready to jump in and save the day. Uh, Cyborg saying we're gonna work together as a team. And Robin, I love Damien's line. I already have a team, Cyborg, and he needs my help. Ah, oh, yes. My boy! Oh, God, I love Damien so much. Damien is such a jerk till it matters, and then he's the best. Ah! <laughs> he's like my Vegeta. <laughs> he's Damien and Vegeta crossover. Someone draw that for me, please. I need it in my life. I need Vegeta going. And I need Damien going. And, like, Vegeta, like, very sternly looking down, and Damien looking up in defiance. Ah, oh, that'd be so good. <laughs> anyway, uh, they're, they're, so, they're such a pair. Um, so John gets caught in, you know, robot wiring tentacle things, and Damien shows up with Cyborg trying to help. Um, interesting connection to, to be made here. Damien's got a plan that he figures out while uh, tr attempting to hack Amazo's equipment. Uh, and he's got an idea. But we need two things to win. Uh, first, uh, he needs Cyborg to get possessed by Amazo. Since Amazo realizes that Cyborg would be a better conduit than Superboy. Uh, so first he needs Cyborg to get possessed by Amazo. And then he needs um, John to do something. So he kind of sabotages Cyborg in the middle of the fight and ties him up, uh, allowing Amazo to uh, take his body over, which we get a pretty cool shot right there. I got to I gotta be honest, that's, that's a pretty evil-looking Cyborg. I quite like that. Um, and... John gets one of Batman's gloves free. Um, 
and uh, Damon says, okay, now you'll have 15 seconds once this starts. Uh, as Cyborg Amazo is about to attack him. Eight seconds, it's starting to move. Um, and John takes his father's cape and runs at Cyborg, catching him in it like a bull. Uh, and that gives Damien the time he needs to put on his father's glove and shoot this wire thing that John then puts into Cyborg's brain, uh, giving Cyborg a stroke, kicking Amazo out, getting him offline long enough for uh, Superboy to beat the shit out of him. Um, the League gets free, and then they're able to defeat Amazo. Uh, in the aftermath of all of it, um, Cyborg's talking to Damien, uh, and I love, I love, love, love the explanation. Uh, Come on, Stone, a simple reboot should resolve the issue and get you back on your feet. My father's contingency plan worked perfectly. I hate to say it, but at times he impresses me. Contingency plan? My father keeps records of how to take down every league, every Justice Leaguer, should they need to be destroyed. I gambled he'd keep an updated copy locally in the uniform, and I was right. Wait a sec. Your dad has plans to destroy his teammates? Just in case. Yours doesn't? I mean, he has all their birthdays in his calendar. <laughs> so I was like, what happened? I used a neural pulse in Batman's uniform to give you a transit ischemic attack, thus cutting off your connection to your mechanical organs. You gave me a freaking stroke? <laughs> well... Technically, a TIA is a mini-stroke, but yes. And the stress you suffered shorted out the Amazo AI for a moment. Uh, so, I mentioned it, but on Trade Talk tonight, I'm talking about Tower of Babel, in which it's revealed that Batman has plans to take out all of the Justice League. So stay tuned for that, or watch the video posted on its own on Friday, but I thought that was a pretty crazy little little connection right there that uh, that it just happened to, to coincide like that. It was pretty funny. Um, so if you ever wondered about what the the long-term effects of Tower of Babel are, Super Sons is an example. Anyway, Victor forgives the boys. No one talks about that Batman still has contingency plans to take down the League. They just kind of accept it now. <laughs> Which I'm fine with. Um, and then we get the, the bookmark for the end of the story. Uh, man, it was such a good series. And I do love this cover. Uh, it's, it's a great way to send off the series. So, I don't know. The Super Sons aren't going anywhere, really. We're still getting the miniseries, which probably, all things considered, being able to just tell its own story, be focused on its own thing, is probably a pretty good idea. And it'll be... It, it may even be better. I just really love this, and I'm still sad to see it go, even though we're getting stuff with the same characters by the same writer. I know, the 12-issue series is, for all intents and purposes, a continuation, but still, I'm a little, I'm a little like, man, I hope it gets good enough to get, like, another 12-issue, and another, and another, and another. Um, the exciting thing about the 12-issue series is... I really like Super Sons as an ongoing. I think it's a really fun ongoing. I don't really know if I can recommend which arcs to pick up or anything. I think it's just kind of like, not slice of life, but it's the kind of thing that you're reading mainly for the character interaction, more so than the events of the story. Uh, it's not like any of the individual arcs of Super Sons was fantastic storytelling with, you know, a brilliant plot and all that stuff. All the, the plots and stuff were fine. What was really great about it was reading the character interactions, seeing Damien be a jerk to John because he was trying to be cool in front of the Teen Titans. Stuff like that is just really, really cool uh, and, and great to read on a character level. Whereas, I don't know, the the miniseries, or the, the arcs themselves, I don't really know. Um, I don't really know how well it's going to hold up individually. Um, but... The 12 issue miniseries or max. Is it a miniseries? What is it? just 12 issue limited series? Whatever. Um, that'll probably have 
a continuous plot through the whole thing. Once it's all complete, it'll be sold in trade. That'll probably be a better starting point for Super Sons, yada yada. Um, so, we'll see. And maybe since it's going to be doing its own thing, it won't have to worry about continuity as much, which might just give him a story that he can tell more easily. Um, Alright, let's see here. Philip Kelton says, It's okay, if anyone should have the ability to kill anyone, it should be the paranoid man dressed as a furry. <laughs> fair point, fair point. Oh, man. Hope everyone's doing good in the comments. Uh, reviews from the Batcave says, Super Sons reads great as a whole. That's good to hear since I haven't gone back to redo reread any of the series. Um, I've just been really, really enjoying it in monthlies, uh, you know? It's just been really great that way. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to my final single issue of the week. Wonder Woman, number 47. Uh, the Dark Gods, part two. Uh, so people on Earth are losing faith in their gods, pledging their devotion to the Dark Gods um, that are coming... And so people of shaky or susceptible faith are are being manipulated by this mystical force, and that includes Supergirl. Um, now, in all honesty, that's reasonably clever. If you think about it from Supergirl's perspective, say you are a, a person of reasonable religious devotion, and then the worst possible thing in in imagination happens and you lose your whole fucking planet yeah maybe you'd uh you'd start questioning your god a little bit then right uh so she's at best on shaky terms with rao kryptonian god um and so she's been susceptible to the dark gods and manipulated by them and now they're controlling her and and using her to attack wonder woman who has deep faith in her gods or her family I guess or who I guess that makes her a god since Williamson's being really hardcore on the whole born of Zeus thing um okay cool it's it's a fun fight like anything I mean it's it's kind of cool uh let me tell you, Wonder Woman kicked the shit out of Superman. Supergirl don't stand a damn chance. Uh, Robert Emmett says, is this Darkseid related? Nope, Darkseid's out of this. He's back to being a young man and we'll next see Darkseid. Not counting Mr. Miracle in uh, Justice League Odyssey. Uh, but yeah, just Wonder Woman pretty much tosses uh, Supergirl around, gets the lasso around her. Uh, digs in, just like comparing this to breaking a horse, <laughs> and I'm like, well, damn. <sighs> um, anyway, so she commands, she gets the lasso on Supergirl, who's trying to fight it, uh, and Wonder Woman commands her to tell her what's going on with the Dark Gods, uh, and that gives her a, it just makes her pass out, because reasons. Um, meanwhile, Jason, Wonder Woman's brother, Jason Woman, uh, I, I cannot take credit for that joke, but god damn if I'm not going to use that every opportunity I get. So yeah, Jason Woman um, is, is talking with the fates because he's trying to figure out where this armor that he got came from and, and what its purpose is since it allows him to use any of the gods' abilities at any time, one at a time. Um, and the fates tell him that the armor was made for the greatest child of Zeus, and he immediately knows, my sister. And they're like, yes, you got that. Your family didn't, which is why they gave it to you after Zeus died. Um, and he's like, well, then I should give it to Diana, right? And they say, does it look like it would fit her? It's now bonded to you for life. You couldn't give it away if you tried. And he's like, oh, well, I guess I'll have to learn how to use it. Yeah, pretty quick, since the Dark Gods are no longer coming, they're here. Okay, bye! Uh, so yeah, Jason takes off using the speed of Hermes, meets up with Wonder Woman, 
uh, to talk about the Dark Gods and help her fight. Uh, and then the Dark Gods appear as gigantic monoliths um, and immediately start attacking. Uh, but before they can even begin to fight, some pink uh, constructs show up, creations of the Star Sapphires, and take Wonder Woman away to Xamaron, leaving Jason Woman all on his own to save the world from the Dark Gods. And god damn, I was like totally with this book until that that ending. Like, I'm excited to read the Wonder Woman annual. Dead honest, I'm excited to read that because Wonder Woman, Xamarons, yeah, sure, cool. Uh, my, conclu my cliffhanger being, Jason now has to save the world. Well, I guess the world's fucked because Jason Woman kind of sucks, but whatever. And I, I'm not rooting for him because he's Jason Woman. I just, I so don't care for that ending. I don't know, it's hilarious. Um... Like, the idea that Jason got the armor that was meant for his sister to make his sister better, and now he has to figure out how to use it? Okay, yeah, sure, give Jason a four-issue series. Let's not have him in the Wonder Woman book anymore. How's that sound? No? No? That's not an option? Fine. <sighs> Philip Kelton says, why don't you like Jason? Because I don't give a shit about Wonder Woman's brother that, like, just showed up. And, and I just, I don't care. That's not interesting. Do you really, like, like, would you really read anything if Batman's long-lost brother showed up in a book? Would you care? Would you give the slightest of shits? Like, of course there's precedent for this, right? Especially with, with fucking Supergirl, of all people, on the cover. Uh, you know, Superman's cousin. Yeah, there's precedent that that could turn into an interesting character. I don't know what people thought at the time. The Silver Age was weird. There was there was a super horse. Okay, I don't I don't have to sit here and justify the fucking Silver Age to anybody. <laughs> but like dead serious, why? I don't know. This just feels like lazy storytelling. I think it's been pretty abundantly clear that Robinson doesn't have a great grasp on how to write Wonder Woman. He's decent at plotting. I'll give him... I, I'm somewhat invested legitimately... Yeah, I'm, I would say I'm legitimately invested in this plot. It's a lot better than the Dark Side shit. Um... It's actually dealing with something directly affecting Wonder Woman, but she's so tangential in her own book. It just feels like mod era Wonder Woman all over again, and that's just the definition of disappointing. Um, we're on issue 47. Uh, who was it taken over at issue 50? Um, name, enter my brain. Um, hold on. Let me go to my notifications on Twitter. I was talking to him about it, being excited. Uh, had a whole conversation with, uh, with Jid2012 about Harry Potter's alternate history. Steve Orlando. Steve Orlando is taking over Wonder Woman uh, at issue 50 on the writing duties. I, I forget the, um, the artist that's jumping on the book. Um... I'd be fine if this artist stayed, because this artist does some really, really stunning work, uh, and has just unfortunately been paired with a, a lackluster writer, in my opinion, which is unfortunate, because Wonder Woman deserves nothing but the best, and we, we have half of that equation. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, I just... Oh no, Jason Woman! This would be a great time to kill Jason Woman. Just saying, killing a Jason has done really well for DC in the past. And then you can reboot him and bring him back as a gritty anti-hero 
who tries to kill people, and Wonder Woman's all like, no, and Jason's all like, why did you let me die? And Wonder Woman will be all like, I was teleported away by the samurai! <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Just unfortunate. Excited for new things for that book. That's where I'm at. Kind of liking some of things going on, but have not been a fan of this run. I hate to say. All right. That'll do it for the single issues, folks. I am sweating balls. It is hot as hell in this house. What the fuck, air conditioner? I'm just going to take a nap. How's everyone doing in the live comments? Good? You good? Hoping so. Sorry, I'm just hot as balls. I don't I don't know if I have the energy to go on. I've been exhausted at work this week. Fucking craziness. All week I've been given the busiest job three days in a row, and it's probably gonna be continuing the rest of the week too. About to be like, Ian, we're gonna assign you on this job, and I'll be like, fuck you, pay me. <laughs> Oh, and this is fucking morning meeting. All right, does anyone have any questions? Yes, Ian. Um, fuck you, pay me. <laughs> uh, okay, Ian. Uh, does anyone have anything else? Ian, I got you. No, but it's different though. Okay, what? Fuck you, pay me more. <laughs> anyway. Let's go ahead and move along to Trade Zock. Hi everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Trade Talk. We're wrapping up the Justice League books by talking about uh, Mark Wade's first official volume on Justice League. Uh, I'd been doing Morrison's run, but I really do like this first volume of Wade's run, and I just had never read anything past it, because I never bought anything past it. Um, but I do feel that it's it's pretty cool to see the the team now passed off to another writer, even though, of course, uh, Wade, as well as a couple other writers, stepped in for uh, filler arcs uh, during Morrison's run. But this is arguably the most famous... Um, Justice League story from the era in which Grant Morrison was writing Justice League. Like, you know, New World Order, uh, Rock of Ages, Tower of uh, World War III, um, all of those those arcs uh, are, are, like, really important and build the team and, and create this level of icon that the book gets up to. And then that's all handed over to Wade. And Wade kind of like wrecks it, but in a really interesting and compelling and to be honest, fucking cool ass way. Um, so let's talk about something that I find interesting. But first we'll talk about just the general premise of the book. Batman being the paranoid character that he is has kept files on each member of the Justice League on ways to take them down should they ever betray the Earth or fall under someone's control who is evil, like a telepath or like what happened a couple years later with Maxwell Lord controlling Superman. So anyway, uh, we have we have that that is Batman's contingency plan for the Justice League is, is to have ways to take them down. The um, the plans themselves fall into the hands or are, are, are stolen by Ra's al Ghul who knows how Batman thinks and is certain that Batman has these plans. So he, he steals them via Talia and uses them on the Justice League right before he has this other master plan to wreck the world so he can take control of it and restore nature to a proper sense of balance. And that's where the title comes from, Tower of Babel. 
That's the wrong direction, Ian. Tower of Babel. Razogul's evil plan is to transmit a frequency that affects the speech area of the brain. So at first, no one can read anything. And secondly, the, the second phase of it, no one can understand anything anyone says. So there's, there's the, the general plot of the book. Batman finds out way too late what's going on, tries to warn the League, but ultimately the damage has been done. So even after they defeat Ra's al Ghul, there are some deep scars left in the League, and very few of them trust Batman now, uh, forcing him kind of to leave and uh, casting a, a huge shadow on, of suspicion on Robin, Tim Drake at the time, with Young Justice, and Nightwing with the Teen Titans. Uh, though I think at that point they were just going by the Titans. So, oh, and even though Oracle was in the league, she's now out basically, effectively, too, because she's so tied in with Batman that they assume she had some, some part of it. So none of the, the league members trust her either. So Batman's kind of ruined everything. Um, so yeah, this is really interesting because we get, it's, it's worth talking about the meta context for why Grant Morrison did what he did with putting the league together. Because the perception at the time was it could never work again. It was really simple back in the day, but the continuities got too complicated and it just didn't seem believable to have these larger than life personalities all on the same team all at the same time together the threats would seem inconsequential and the the characters wouldn't work well together they'd just all come off like jerks and grant morrison said no the justice league is cool because it's the greatest heroes working off of each other and and sometimes butting heads with each other and so let's let's do it. Let's let's put the Justice League back to what it should be. Let's make Justice League of America great again. Or I, I suppose Grant Morrison would have put it more like, let's make Justice League of America great again. Ah, uh, that was terrible. Anyway, so as soon as he leaves, what's the first? Literally the first thing that happens. We write Batman out of the Justice League. We, we immediately have taken Batman out of the Justice League the second Grant Morrison leaves the book. But, and of course, like, he comes back and he still fights with the League and all that stuff. But, like, the first step is to cast suspicion on him and effectively remove him. Uh, Bruce, of course, walks away himself. He doesn't even wait for a vote. Uh, he knows the damage he's done, but he's not going to say he was wrong. Uh, because ultimately he is right. Mind controllers take over the league all the fucking time. It constantly happens. Why wouldn't you have a contingency plan to deal with each other? Uh, maybe if, if Wonder Woman had a contingency plan to fight Superman, uh, fucking, what is it, OMAC project? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Fucking this shit wouldn't have happened in OMAC Project just a couple years later. <laughs> gotta find it. God, this is forever and a day. Not a good story, but damned if this Wonder Woman vs. Superman fight isn't the coolest shit. <sighs> Where's it at? I'm gonna be real pissed if I find out it's wrong. Oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, yeah, Greg Rucker wrote this. So, we got... This whole situation that happened back in OMAC Project, where Maxwell Lord took over Superman's mind and uh, was forcing him to hurt people and, and do things, of course, he wouldn't want to do, uh, like attack Wonder Woman. And so we have this huge, drawn-out fight of Wonder Woman just and Superman just fucking going at it with, like, nothing she can do. She breaks her fucking wrist at one point. Um, 
and and just has to like come up with ways to beat the shit out of him. So she has she has to get behind him and uh, slam her bracelets on his ears to affect his super senses. Um, God, I gotta find the wrist break because that's the best fucking part. Uh, yeah, so she punches him. Or no, he grabs her wrist so hard that he breaks it. Uh, so she gets down and uh, God, there's the panel right there. Ah, oh, that was that was the moment. She gets down and she has to move her bracelet up to to literally be a brace for her wrist, so she can continue fighting. Um, and it all comes down to her having to get control of Maxwell Lord, put the lasso of truth around him, and get an answer as to um, how she can stop Superman from uh, from being under his control. And he says the only way to do that is to kill him, and she does it. <laughs> So that's all Mac Project. Not good, but that's a good moment. Why didn't Wonder Woman have a contingency plan? Because she's honorable. Because she trusts kal -El. Clark, Superman, whatever. She trusts him. She wouldn't want to, to scheme and think of a way to beat him, uh, you know, ahead of time. She'd deal with it in the moment. Okay? And dealing with it in the moment meant killing someone. Not having a way to incapacitate Superman so that you can think of a long-term solution of how to deal with the thing led to a man's death. OMAC Project's the best argument for uh, Tower of Babel, hands down. It really is. And you'll have to excuse me because I swear I'm about to sneeze, but I'm going to maintain my professional composure and not do that because I'm a boss. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so that's like kind of the big thing. It's like, Okay, we immediately remove Batman because maybe Grant Morrison is right and the team can work amazing together. You can make these gigantic level, you know, apocalyptic threats uh, possible and yada, 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 yada. But you know what? Not everyone's Grant Morrison. Not everyone can write like Grant Morrison. So sometimes to write the Justice League... We need to create tension on the Justice League, which I'm totally okay with. Totally okay with. Uh, surprisingly so. So long as they overcome it and work through it. I don't know if that happens, because I've never read Beyond Tower of Babel. So shame on me. Shame on me. Uh, obviously it, it does, because marketing at the very least. We, we get, you know, them working together in the future again. Uh, Batman's been on the Justice League since, I know that. But, you know, there's, there's that underlying thing. Am I okay with tension existing on the Justice League? Yes. Hands down, yes. Don't even have to think about it. Am I okay with tension existing on the Justice League affecting the stories making it so we can't have a justice league book of the main team fuck no um that's the important distinction for me i don't want there to not be an a-list justice league team because a writer's too afraid to write them all correctly uh i'm i don't need a star trek situation where these are the greatest heroes ever and they're never gonna have a disagreement or fight on anything um because they're so far above us. No, 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 no. Superheroes are the modern mythology, not the not the um, striving vision. Uh, they they have elements of it. They have elements of striving vision, but they still have deep flaws and interpersonal conflicts, like the Olympians. Um, they are the modern myth. So, yeah, I'm totally fine with this. Um, I want to talk a minute about uh, Bruce's plans, because I really, really like this, and I want to compare it to something else that did it. Um, so, for Martian Manhunter, the plan was to hit him with a rocket filled with nanites that, once exposed to oxygen, um, will immediately catch fire, and they cling to the very molecules of his body so he cannot... Um, he cannot shape change his way out of it. Uh, 
For Aquaman, he is blasted with uh, Scarecrow's fear toxin and is made afraid of water, forcing him to get weaker and weaker as time goes on. Plastic Man is hit with a freeze bomb and uh, broken with an ice pick into about a million pieces, which is pretty cool. Uh, what else happens here? Oh, Green Lantern is given a hypnotic suggestion um, and believes he is blind. Again with the hypnosis. I'm, I'm beginning to think it wasn't a Grant Morrison thing. It was just a 90s thing. Hypnosis is really easy or something. Uh, the Flash is hit with a bullet that uh, vibrates in his spine. Um, so he can't... He can't let it pass through him. It it's molecules vibrate or some I don't know random bullshit, um, and gives him seizures at light speed, and a, a microbot is injected into Diana's brain, giving her the perception that she is fighting an opponent of equal strength to her in every way. Um, so Wonder Woman's heart, uh, Wonder Woman's body is going through all kinds of physical labor as if she is in the fight of her fucking life. Meanwhile, she's actually unconscious and just giving herself a heart attack. Um, so yeah, those are the plans. Uh, and I love Literally every... Oh, Superman, right. Superman is exposed to a piece of red kryptonite that has been... Or a piece of kryptonite that has been irradiated to the point of it changing to the color red. Um, which causes his skin to go translucent and the solar radiation that usually powers him like a solar battery to affect every nerve ending, muscle fiber, and internal organ... Uh, putting him to the point where he will not be dead, but he will wish he is dead because it's just too much for his body to handle. Um, interesting. That one I'll say is a little iffy. But as for the, the methods to defeat the Justice League, man, that is so much better than Scott Snyder's bullshit. <laughs> uh, Endgame sucked. Ugh. Oh, man. Anyone that knows me knows I don't like Scott Snyder's Batman run, and I've gone over it and over it, and I don't feel like just sitting here and shit-talking Scott Snyder. But, like, for anyone that liked Endgame, because, oh, it's so cool that Batman came up with ways to defeat the Justice League, go read Tower of Babel. Or, fuck, go watch Justice League Doom. That movie's based off this not very well, but it's better than... Than Endgame. Um, so anyway. Uh, <sighs> the Justice League's been defeated by Batman's plans in the hands of Ra's al Ghul. Uh, I love the, the plans though so much. All of them... The important thing is... They're both clever. And a lot of them are really, really well thought out and smart, smart. Like, on a character level, smart. Um, not all of them. I think the Plastic Man one's kind of eh. I think the the Aquaman one is really, really clever, but doesn't really have much bearing on the character besides just creating kind of a, a unique idea that making Aquaman afraid of water. Uh, same for Martian Manhunter. But Wonder Woman, Kyle, Flash... And to a level, Superman, I really, really like. So I'm going to go through those. Uh, the Superman one's probably the weakest of that bunch, but the idea of Batman having a way to take down Superman that's not hit him with a green rock, but does involve kryptonite, 
overpowering Superman, getting him so he can't control himself, so that he is just in unbelievable, excruciating pain, is a really, really clever idea, because Superman's not used to pain. Um, like, Superman has definitely felt pain, particularly, like, mainline continuity Superman, but you'd be hard-pressed to convince me Superman has felt unbearable physical pain. Uh, the, the kind of, like, someone going through, um, serious medical ailment kind of stuff. Uh, so to, to do that to Superman, it's gonna be such an alien feeling to him, given that he's the Man of Steel, and it's, it's non-lethal, which is, I think, a really, really clever way to go about things. Um, it's a, it's a unique turn on him, and it's, it's just gonna knock him the fuck out. Uh, so I really like that side of it. I'll talk about a problem I have with it uh, in the context of the story. But that one's pretty clever. Um, what else? Flash, again, this one's still on the weaker side, but knowing that, that Wally would rather let something pass through him um, than, than try to avoid it or, or uh, do something else about getting shot at... And, and just putting him into the state of having a bullet in him that is causing seizures. Uh, again, that's really clever, especially that they just it just fucks his entire life. They get him out of it, and he's like, God, there are entire days where I wished I would... I just prayed for death. How long was I out? 22 minutes. Because, yeah, he's at light speed, and he can't do anything about it. That's, uh, that's really clever. I like that one, too. Uh, not as deep on a character level, but there's there's enough of it there that I really liked. The other two, though, Wonder Woman and Green Lantern are so fucking complex and perfect. Um, Wonder Woman's I really like, and, and here's the moment. Here's the gauntlet being thrown down, folks. You ready? Batman could beat Vegeta or Goku. I know, I, I'm like so tempted to look at the comments right now. Let's let's take a look at that. Uh no, no, I don't I don't got any any comments raging at me that I'm talking crazy, but the way in which Batman takes down Wonder Woman, realizing that she has a natural drive of competition, that she is an incredibly competitive person and will not give up on a fight. Um, once she's committed to fighting someone, once she's locked in combat, she is there. That's, that's her. She's focused. She wants to win no matter what. Uh, as long as the cost is hers, not other people's, to be fair. But, yeah, Wonder Woman will fight to the bitter end. Knowing that about her is the thing that, that lets Bruce take her down by by creating this idea of an opponent that's perfectly her equal um that's really really clever and it's a really interesting character insight into wonder woman uh from bruce's perspective but also that's the same legit mentality that that goku and vegeta have i will give the caveat i don't think this plan would work on um Trunks or, or Goten or Goku or not Goku, uh, Gohan. God, names tonight. Uh, I don't think that strategy would work on them. It damn sure would work on Vegeta and Goku. Uh, assuming they they can't figure it out before they've exhausted themselves. Yeah, that's gonna work on them. Anyway, um, so yeah, well, lots of lots of craziness going on there. Um. They eventually decide to work together to figure out how to... Uh, oh, wait, shit, I didn't talk about Kyle. I'm sorry. Um, Kyle's one I really like. Making Kyle think he's blind so he can't use the ring is really, really smart because... All right, here's, here's the game, children. Let me grab my bookmark. If you are watching at home right now and you have access to a sketch pad, please get it out now because we are going to play a game. Boys and girls, where are my pencils? I had like, yeah, there we go. I had like a whole box of pencils and I couldn't find it. 
Um, so we're going to play a game. Doesn't have to be much. We're just going to do a quick game here. Free hand. And with your eyes open, uh, first we're going to put just a straight line down the page. This part, not freehand. This is just for comparison. So we got a nice thick line right down our sketchbook, right? And keep in mind, I'm not an artist. I keep this as a way to make rhetorical points uh, about art, even though I suck at art. So we're going to draw three shapes. Freehand, carefully, but quickly, we're going to draw a triangle, a square, and a circle. All right, there we go. Three shapes, and you know what? Let's let's make it four, and an X. PlayStation. All right, so there's my free. There's my site. H T. <laughs> there's my site side. Okay. Now the other side of this. Do it with your eyes closed. Okay, so let's see here. My triangle is not complete. My square falls into itself, which I'm and and goes above, which I'm I'm reasonably pleased that I even connected it to be honest with you. My circle, I have a lot of practice drawing circles to be fair. Uh, I have to draw a lot of zeros at work. So that actually turned out pretty good from memory, though as you can see it's not connected properly it has to overlap and overshoot it quite a bit before it connects and then my x uh has a much more swooshy section right here uh much more curved beginning um it's a little unsure of where to connect and i was really aiming to try to have it be perfectly perpendicular but as you can see i have much more room up here or down here than i do up here the angle up here much greater than the angle down here so there's a lot of obviously this is not like some kind of of beautiful representation of, of perfect geometry and i'm not an artist so it's not going to be but it's much more competent it's much more clean than this side where i've drawn it blind now let's try again. Let's do this experiment a second time, but do things that are not geometry. Let's do, or well, it's still geometry. Everything's geometry if you think like a 3D modeler, which I am. Um, but yeah, let's let's do this again. Sight and blind. Let's draw something more complex. Not much, but slightly more complex. Let's draw a stick figure with a smiley face. Uh, and, I don't know, what's a simple shape to draw? Uh, a, a remote control in his hand with a couple buttons on it, all right? So I'm going to just take my time. I'm going to do a nice and smooth stick figure. Clearly identifiable. One arm, second arm. He's got a remote control with a couple buttons on it in his hand he's got an eyeball another eyeball and he's smiling because he's happy that he's got a remote control all right perfectly identifiable of what it's supposed to be let's try it blind Shit, where's the head? <laughs> you see how this gets really, really complicated the more you go. Uh, I, like, I put the labels here. I don't think you even need them. It's very clear to tell which ones I'm doing right and which ones I'm doing wrong. I'm actually reasonably happy with myself that I got the buttons in the damn box for the remote control. Uh, but obviously, like, do I even need to go through what's wrong here? The stick goes through his head. The head isn't centered on the body. The head isn't even uh, connected properly. The eyes are fucking, like, down by his cheeks. Uh, the mouth is... 
crooked. Um, the arms and legs aren't connected to the main body. Uh, there's a lot wrong with that one. That's a very simple image. So the more complex this gets, the harder it gets. So Kyle, being a professional artist, being someone who has to craft it, it makes a lot of sense. And especially since Will is so... Um, Will is so necessarily connected to the ring and, and had been at this time too. A lot of people give Jeff Johns credit for connecting the green ring with willpower when it had always existed that way. Um, or not always, but had existed that way in the comics for a long time. Uh, needing willpower to rule, use the wing ring and not being able to be confident in what you're creating because the main thing you use for creation, which is your eye, yeah, here's an idea, Ian. Point the sharp pencil at your eye. It's not like people will know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, so like the idea of of connecting that to to use the the blindness not only to destabilize the constructs, but destabilize the ability to create them because it nullifies the self-confidence needed to create them. I will go out and say directly, Mark Wade invented the best possible way to take down a Green Lantern. As far as I know, he'd been, he was the only person to say, make them blind. Uh, he was the first person to say, make one blind, and they will not be able to use the ring. Um, I talked about Justice League Doom being based on JLA, uh, Tower of Babel. Their plan for Green Lantern is fucking stupid. Their, their adaptation, it's a very loose adaptation. Their adaptation for how to take down Green Lantern totally undercuts one of the most brilliant and in-depth character-defining moments of that book for me. Um, I adore this idea. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's night and fucking day here, the kind of the kind of results you can get uh, if you if one of your your methods for dealing with the world is suddenly stripped away from you so I really really do love that touch that's that is quite brilliant stuff um, on a character level for Green Lantern mm, love it best best uh, way that Batman came up with uh, how to take someone down um, so I want to talk again about the, the red kryptonite, uh, the irradiated kryptonite would probably be a better way to say it. Um, the only reason I don't like that in the context of the story is I love what it does to Superman. I think that's really clever, unique, and creative, and it's not just Green Rock, is they go into why Batman created what he did. They go into his reasoning. Um, you even get to read his log about it. Someday I'm sure it's going to come down to just him and me. For a lot of others, I could just wing it if I had to, but not Clark. If anyone requires a methodical and considered response, it's Superman. If it's to the death, that's easy. I have my chunk of kryptonite. I have a pretty good idea of how it works and what it would take to synthesize more. But what if I merely want to stop him in his tracks for a while? Interestingly enough, certain properties of kryptonite persist even when it's undergone change at the atomic level. And this goes into, like, what exactly the rock does. But that he designed the irradiated, irradiated kryptonite to incapacitate but not kill Superman is great for Batman. Why the fuck does Ra's al Ghul give a shit if Superman lives or dies? It's never explained in the story. You can create headcanon and reasons for it, and we can talk about those. I can say maybe he wants Superman around because he's going to need someone in case there are more galactic threats that are going to hit Earth. I don't think that's a, a really great explanation, but it at least makes sense. But like, okay, Ra's al Ghul wants to take out the Justice League so he can take control of the world and not have to worry about them as a threat. Cool. Brilliant. Yeah, totally works. Um... Why not just kill Superman? Why would you want to just incapacitate him? Right, so it's like one of those things where it's like, oh, okay. 
yeah, that's just that's just not good. That's just poorly thought out. Like Mark Wade, what I think happened is Mark Wade got a really really cool idea for what to do with with Superman and and like how to take him out, but he didn't think to put it in a proper context for the story. Um, so this book is certainly not without its faults, but that's okay. Uh, God, the fucking creepiness of transparent skin Superman, though. <laughs> that is the shit nightmares are made of. Uh, <laughs> anyway. So the world is just going to hell. No one can communicate with anybody. Uh, planes are falling out of the sky. Doctors don't know how to read medical charts. Ambulances don't know how to read street signs. Um, no one can communicate. World financial markets are in ruin. Fuck yeah, go Raz Uh, and Raz is, is slowly planning to make his move. But the Justice League managed to rally together, um, even though they've been definitely damaged. Um, and they currently don't trust Batman, but they are working with him until the crisis is stopped. They end up saving the day, defeating Raz al Ghul, uh... Oh, I didn't mention, uh, the way Roz kind of distracted Batman the whole time was to steal the bodies of his parents and threaten to drop them in a Lazarus pit, which really, like, fucked with Batman and, and totally distracted him and, and just may have not paid any attention to what was happening with the League at the time. So I quite like that. Uh... Wade writes a really, really good Wonder Woman scene where they've got a member of the League of Ex Assassins um, tied up with the lasso, and he's got a, a um, bioweapon in his hands that all he has to do is open it, and the city's fucked. Uh, but he hasn't done it yet, so uh, Wonder Woman starts to talk to him. You, the magic of the lasso compels you to speak only the truth, so tell me. Are you ready to die today? Yes. Really? What if your mask works as well as your comrade's? Comrade died because his mask didn't, his gas mask didn't work. Release the virus and you're its first victim. Martyr. I'll be a martyr. No, you won't. Do you think the man who sent you here even knows your name? Who will remember you? I. You're trying to. I. There is no honor in serving Ra's al Ghul. There is only the suffering you being up you bring upon the innocent, and the grief of abandoning everything you know as you draw your last agonizing breath on this earth. And I promise you, the pain will be indescribable. So I ask you again, are you ready to die? No. Ah, such a good scene. I love that. The way Wonder Woman interrogates someone or, or gets what she wants from someone is to be honest with them. It's beautiful. Uh, anyway, so they, they end up saving the day, defeating uh, Roz and, and Talia's evil plan, yada yada. Uh, and then it's time for the fallout. So the League discusses whether or not Batman, does, or they trust Batman to be in the League, and they, they kind of all go through their reasoning um, oddly enough, the most poignant thing for me is Plastic Man. Uh, they asked Plastic Man what he thought, what he thinks, he goes, Come on, man, he brought you in. Plastic Man goes, Yeah, yeah, he did. I owe him. I know that. Then, he, like, just thinks about being cracked open, uh, when he was encased in ice. Get him out of here. <laughs> like, I really like that. That's that's a really poignant scene that just kind of works for me, that he just he can't get over being betrayed like that. Um, so they... It all comes down to Superman, and Superman doesn't... No, Superman hasn't told anyone uh, how he's going to vote, uh, so they decide to go into the meeting room to confront Batman and, and tell him their votes, uh, and he's left. Uh, and, of course, Superman's last line is yes, um, which is really smart because it's, it's, an, it's a uh, commentary, or it's an answer to a completely different question. But it's also how Superman was going to vote uh, as to whether or not Batman should stay in the league. Uh, I guess that makes you the swing vote. 
You're the closest thing he has to a friend on this team. How well do you really know him? Or I guess more to the point, how well does he know you? Well, enough to know better than any of us how you'll vote. Yes. He know Batman knows how Superman would vote. So he, he left. And the answer is, of course, going to be Superman would vote yes, but Batman knows he's betrayed the trust of the League, so he left of his own volition, rather than be kept around because Superman would vote yes. I love it. Ah, oh, it's so good. <laughs> anyway. Uh, and then there's the fallout of the different members of the Bat family not being trusted anymore. Uh, and that's, that's pretty good. Uh, I also like how this volume opens, especially since this is a Ra's al Ghul bad guy or, or villain story where, you know, he's he wants to rule the world so he can counteract the effects of global warming, yada, yada, yada. Um, this issue opens, or this volume opens with a fill-in story written by Dan Curtis Johnson about the Atom discovering a city of microbes forming in... Uh, forming on a tumor in a child's brain like it's a a functioning society in in the miniature scale um so rather than cut it out because it's sentient life clearly he gets the justice league to go with them and they try to convince the uh rulers of the city to to evacuate they can't survive there and uh, it turns into a whole thing. They don't want to believe the Justice League. They torture Superman. The the League has to escape. It's all a lot happens in one issue. Um, ultimately, their city's destroyed, and Superman has to look on uh, as he sees another civilization die. But it's okay because one of the lives escaped and made it to a different part of the body. But anyway. There, the the whole commentary here on this society is killing this the the planet on which they live, uh, and they just won't listen to reason about changing their ways uh, before violence has to be inflicted, and then you have Ra's al Ghul inflicting violence because humanity won't change its ways and and save the world. That's kind of clever shit. That is pretty clever shit. Um, so yeah, just, just good-ass volume. Mark Waid really kills it. There's also a backup story called The Green... Oh, multiple backup stories, my bad. There's a very short one, it's a Superman-Batman story called The Green Bullet, in which someone's tried to frame Superman for a murder, and Batman's doing the investigation to make sure it wasn't Superman. He knows, but he wants to make sure that he's not being biased, uh, since they're friends. So he figures out it's not, he, he's certain it's not Superman, and then it turns out to be Inner Gang, and they take him down together. And then we have another bonus story called Revelations with Aquaman and Wonder Woman uh, working together to save some um, guys who have died to get some buried treasure, but it was all meaningless, and they, they caused a bunch of uh, problems in the ocean, pollution, yada yada. Uh, and so Aquaman and Wonder Woman have to work together to save the day here and, and work through their differences, as it were. So yeah, it's a good story. Uh, Aquaman gets caught in Wonder Woman's lasso and admits that he has that he's attracted to her. Uh, so that scene in Justice League has some comic book accuracy to it, I guess. Um, I don't know. Tower of Babel, really strong story, though, in my opinion. Really, really well thought out. Mark Wade does kick off his his official run on the book with a lot of steam. Um, and I just have never read anything beyond this for any reason. Uh, and I, I don't really necessarily plan to any time in the near future. But, you know, maybe one day, uh, once I've read all the other comic books. Anyway, that'll do it for this episode of Trade Talk. Uh... We'll go on, try to get out of DC for a little while, uh, since I've been doing so many DC series lately. We'll get out of DC for a little while and do uh, some Marvel and some independent stuff for a couple weeks here uh, in future, in the next uh, few weeks of Trade Talk before I go back to anything else. Uh, though I'm really liking going back and doing these these long arcs and, and these runs. Uh, 
I do eventually want to go give a, a crack at the War Games saga, uh, like I did with No Man's Land. So that'll be the next big uh, run I do, I think. Anyway, everyone, thank you very much for watching. Until next time, bye! Oh. Man, how's everyone doing in the live comments? I'm down to one person watching. Woo! I talk a lot about these volumes. And the the trade talk episodes get pretty decent views, but they just very little interest during the live show. Eh, it happens. Well, live audience, thanks for coming. Much appreciated. Really enjoyed having you here. Crazy that we had this coincidence of Super Sons and uh, Justice League Tower of Babel lining up in that way, but that was pretty fun. Um, anyway, that'll do it for this week's episode of Comic Reviews. Thank you very much for watching. Till next time, bye!